Hello, uh, in this second mind map on CNS pathology, we are going to look at CNS tumors and CNS infections, which hopefully will provide you with an overview and an approach. So beginning with CNS tumors, uh, remember that the age is very, very important, the location within the CNS, as well as some uh, key points in the relevant history that you should always be aware of. Of course, for age, we will just very simply consider children and adults. And for the site we'll look at later, in terms of relevant history, the history of previous malignancy or known malignancy is very important because of the possibility of CNS tumors actually being metastases rather than primary tumors. Also, a history of an immunocompromised state is also important because this predisposes them to certain types of tumors, such as lymphoma, with a differential diagnosis of infection. The site is very important, and this helps us clinically to not only localize the tumor, but we can also correlate it with histogenesis and also with the age to give us a clue of what we are looking at. So let's start off with the meningeal coverings. Uh, one of the commonest tumors in the CNS is a meningioma. This is a tumor arising from the meningothelial cells. Here is an example of a gross picture of a meningioma. Very often these tumors are very well demarcated from the brain parenchyma. They do not actually look uh, that similar to the substance of the brain. Sometimes they have this world appearance and this is classical appearance of a meningioma. Now we will also want to consider tumors located in the midline of the brain. So from the line tumors, uh, we have the germ cell tumors, which may sometimes have a cystic component, and also tumors of the pituitary gland. And these are quite interesting because uh, not only can they present with mass effects, such as visual field defects because of compression on the optic chiasm, we can also have endocrine effects. Now moving on to ventricular tumors or periventricular tumors, logically we can actually deduce that these tumors include ependymal tumors such as ependymomas and they also of course can include choroid plexus tumors. So do remember that ependymomas are also considered gliomas. Now for the brain parenchyma itself, it's probably uh, best to divide them into tumors that arise from the neurons which include the mature tumors, one of which is the very rare central neurocytoma. This one often actually arises in the region of the third ventricle. And then we have the immature neuronal tumors. These tend to occur in children. They are highly aggressive. If they are supratentorial, we can call them primitive neuroectodermal tumors or neuroblastomas. And if they occur infratentorially, they are different and they are called medalloblastomas. So the location here is again an important feature. The other aspect of brain parenchyma is of course glial tumors. I've mentioned ependymoma earlier, but the other glial tumors include astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. For astrocytomas, uh, just briefly mention a low-grade and a high-grade one. Uh, an example of a specific low-grade astrocytoma is the pilocytic astrocytoma. It is known as a pilocytic astrocytoma because these tumors, uh, these tumor cells have got extremely long hair-like processes and pilo refers to hair. So essentially we are saying that they are hair or hairy type cells um, and they are astrocytic in nature. And pilocytic astrocytomas are generally uh, low grade, so they are WHO grade 1. And if they are completely excised, the prognosis can be quite good. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the glioblastoma multiform. And this is a grade 4 glioma. It's very high grade, it's very aggressive, and the prognosis is extremely poor for these tumors. The other glial tumor is the oligodendroglioma, which can be graded from grade 1 to grade 3 in the WHO system. Um, one important principle outlining brain tumors, particularly with glial tumors and sometimes with uh, neuronal tumors, 
is the fact that genetics of the tumors are very important. So specific genetic aberrations or mutations are sometimes important to ascertain because they help in the diagnosis, also in the prognostication, and even in the management-related decisions. Because, for example, oligodendrogliomas with specific mutations are more amenable to chemotherapy. So we are going to look at uh, now how uh, the age correlates with the tumor type. So in children, uh, if we just go down this list, we can see that for midline tumors, uh, germ cell tumors are very important differential diagnosis. And for tumors around the ventricular, periventricular areas, they actually tend to occur in children as well. Ependymomas, choroid plexus tumors, immature neuronal tumors, supratentorial and infratentorial medulloblastoma, and uh, last but not least, pilocytic astrocytoma also can occur in children, and often these may have a cystic component. Now, moving on to CNS infections, uh, we just want to have a broad approach, which is to correlate the patterns of infection to specific types of organisms. So, starting off with uh, meningitis, followed by encephalitis, and then a combination, meningoencephalitis, and finally localized parenchymal infections, whether they are abscesses or whether they're just discrete areas of infection in the brain parenchyma. Now let's look at some of the usual suspects in terms of organisms. So bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, and uh, not really an infectious organism, uh, prions, but they can induce infection-like transmission. So bacterial uh, organisms often give rise to purulent meningitis and they can also of course uh, cause localized parenchymal disease such as abscesses. Viruses are a little bit different. They also cause meningitis but a different type, an aseptic meningitis where we see lymphocytes rather than neutrophils and they can give rise to encephalitis and meningoencephalitis. Fungal infections can also cause meningitis and also similar to bacterial infections, localized parenchymal infections. Uh, parasitic organisms often give rise to localized parenchymal infections. And for prion disease, uh, the pattern of involvement of also is often patchy or localized in the brain parenchyma. So on a practical note, uh, what are some of the important main investigations that can be done if uh, CNS infections are suspected? One important uh, test is to examine the CSF. So a lumbar puncture can be done, CSF sample obtained, and this is very carefully divided um, to be sent to the microbiology lab uh, for gram stain, etc., perhaps even uh, ZN stain if the TB is suspected, and then for culture sensitivity. Biochemistry is also an important test because uh, they can be uh, examined for the protein and glucose levels, which differ whether depending on whether it's bacterial, viral infection, etc. Uh, even examination of the actual fluid in the pathology lab, looking at the cytology, is also helpful because uh, usually for bacterial infections, we will see more of an acute inflammatory cell exudate, whereas for viral infections, fungal is more chronic. We can sometimes also see and detect fungal organisms in the CSF as well as bacterial organisms. Other types of tests would be imaging. Uh, this can help to localize the infection and also to ascertain uh, the pattern of infection. And of course, blood culture as well is an important test. So just an overview of uh, CNS tumors in terms of the clinical features, the imaging, the age and relevant history. And then for CNS infections, uh, just a broad overview of the patterns of CNS infection, different organisms, and uh, you can read up on the specific types of infections. In particular, viral infections tend to target specific groups of neurons in the brain and the spinal cord as well.